Ecofeminism is a body of scholarship and an approach to environmental and feminist activism that sees the domination of nature and animals and the domination of women as interconnected. Both women and nature, including animals, have been seen as the property of men, for example, or as resources for men to use. Women have been associated with the body and nature or the material world, while men have been associated with the life of the mind and reason. Ecofeminists envision and strive for a world that is egalitarian and free of logics of domination, whether these logics apply to nature and animals, or to groups of humans who are often seen as closer to nature and animals than white, propertied, able-bodied, able-minded, cis, straight men. Good morning. What can I get you? Good morning. I will have one square inch of waffle with three drops of syrup. Give me a super thin piece of ham. Super thin? Quarter strip of bacon. Super thin piece of ham. Could I have a third of an egg over easy with one bite of hash browns? You wouldn't eat like this in a restaurant. Why do it in a fast food place? The new Monster Breakfast Sandwich at Carl's Jr. Breakfast as big as our burgers. In 1990, ecofeminist scholar Carol Adams published the influential book, The Sexual Politics of Meat. In this work, Adams presents historical and sociological information showing that how we eat is gendered, with men and boys expected to eat more and better food than women and girls, while women and girls are expected to be more disciplined about what and how they eat, to eat sparingly, and even to forgo food so that men and boys can have more in times of scarcity. Adams and other feminist scholars have demonstrated that women and girls are socialized to eat food in a restricted way, opting for feminine foods such as salads, consumed in small quantities so that the women and girls can remain small themselves. Food and sex, as the two primary desires or appetites of the body, are continually interconnected in the social imaginary, and restrictions on what women and girls should eat have paralleled restrictions on their sexual desires. In both the cases of food and sex, women and girls are socialized to suppress their appetites. Men and boys, in contrast, are socialized to have a more unrestrained appetite. Men's food is constructed as the richest and best foods, and the quintessential male food is red meat. It is because food is gendered in these ways that the Carl's Jr. you wouldn't add is perceived as funny because men wouldn't or shouldn't behave like that. These men are comical because they are acting like women on weight loss diets. Scholars such as Adams argue that men's right to eat whatever and however much they want and to eat animal bodies in particular is associated with their perceived sex right or their right of access to women's bodies. One result of these social constructs is that just as there is pressure on women to eat sparingly and to eat non-fattening foods, there is also social pressure on men to eat masculine foods that purportedly express their virility. It is thus more difficult for men than women to be vegetarians or vegans, and harder for them to express concern for animals and the environment, or even concern to eat healthily and ethically. Such concerns and sympathies are seen as sentimental and feminine. In The Sexual Politics of Meat, Adams also analyzes media and literary representations in which women are represented as meat or as animals who are fated to become meat, dead animal bodies are represented as female bodies, and women's flesh is used to market animal flesh. Thirty years after the publication of Adams' book, we continue to see the sexual politics of meat that Adams describes in contemporary meat advertising, but we also see changes. For example, a recent series of Carl's Jr. advertisements perpetuates the sexual politics of meat insofar as they continue to use women's flesh to market animal flesh, and yet they do so with a twist. I love Texas in the springtime. Smoked brisket, mesquite barbecue sauce, and jalapeno straws. You missed a spot. Everyone wants a taste of Texas. Texas. In 
Introducing the Texas Barbecue Thick Burger. New at Carl's Jr. and Hardee's. I love going all natural. It just makes me feel better. Nothing between me and my 100% all-natural, juicy, grass-fed beef. Introducing the all-natural burger, the first ever in fast food, with no antibiotics, no added hormones, and no steroids. Only at Carl's Jr. These ads are actually somewhat subversive in that they show women eating large amounts of messy food voraciously and eating red meat in particular. They show heteronormatively attractive women having strong appetites for what is symbolically male food and the suggestion seems to be that these women have similar appetites for sex as they do for meat. Although, since the 1990s, advertisements thus seem to have changed, so that women are now not only compared to meat, but are also shown as avid consumers of meat, Adam's argument in the sexual politics of meat remains true. Meat eating continues to be gendered masculine, and continues to be highly sexualized, and the bodies of women continue to be used to market the bodies of animals. Adam's ecofeminist scholarship encourages us to compare the interconnections between the sexual objectification of women and the objectification of animals as meat, not because they are the same, but because they share similar logics of patriarchal domination. Since Adam's, numerous scholars have provided updated explorations of the sexual politics of meat. For example, in his 2009 article, Metrosexuality Can Stuff It, Meat Consumption as Heterosexual Masculine Fortification, communications scholar C. Wesley Burkle considers meat in relation to what he calls metrosexuality. According to Burkle, metrosexuality is resented by straight men who see it as an unmanly imposition of women's desires on them or a refashioning of men according to what women want them to be. Now that women are more independent of men financially and thus aren't so often required to marry or have sex with men to survive, they can be more discerning about which men they sleep with and if they have sex with men at all. Put otherwise, the grasp of what feminist scholars have called compulsory heterosexuality is loosening. Men now have to work to get women and to be attractive to women. They now have to conform to feminine tastes. They must attend more to their appearance, their clothes, and their hygiene, and become more cultivated in their behavior and more conscientious about what they eat. According to Burkle, this pushing of men towards a metrosexual ideal is experienced by some straight men as emasculating and feminizing. As in the Queer Eye television series where gay men who are seen as feminine are brought in to teach straight men how to dress, act, eat, and groom in order to appeal to women. Like Adams, Burkle turns to media representations of meat to make his points. He examines hamburger commercials such as Burger King's Mantham in which meat eating is represented as a male liberation movement, a resistance to the emasculating influence of women or feminism. I am man, hear me roar, and numbers too big to ignore, and I'm way too hungry to settle for chick food, cause my stomach's starting to growl, and I'm going on the prowl, for a pure beef double whopper, man that's good, oh yes, I'm a god, I'll admit I've been fed quiche, way tofu, bye bye, now it's for the purest beef I reach. I will eat this meat Until my any turns into an owie I am starved I am incorrigible And I need to scoff 100% pure beef flame grill Good thing down yeah! I am hungry I am, I am I am man. The Double Whopper Man, that's a lot of meat Mantham depicts a men's liberation movement, even comparing it to the black liberation movement with the I am a man slogan. In this imagined men's liberation movement, men reassert their right to be men, to not have to conform to women's expectations and desires. 
This reclamation of a virile, hegemonic, and arguably toxic masculinity is epitomized through their eating of red meat. In another ad, a man buys a military vehicle to restore the balance or to restore his manhood after feeling emasculated by purchasing tofu and carrots under the pitying gaze of another man who is buying copious amounts of red meat. Like Burkle and Adams, Annie Potts and Jovian Perry also explore meat-eating gender and sexuality in their article, Vegan Sexuality, Challenging Heteronormative Masculinity Through Meat-Free Sex. Today, there are vegetarian and vegan dating sites showing that diet may be a criterion by which people choose whom to date. But is this a sexuality? Is there such a thing as vegan sexuality? In a number of ads, such as their 2009 banned Super Bowl ad, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals have, in fact, attempted to give plant-based diets some of the heterosexual allure that has long been associated with meat-eating, and they actively promote the rumors that vegans taste better and vegans have better sex. Indeed, PETA seems to be trying to provide a veganized version of Carl's Jr. and Burger King ads, highly eroticizing the vegan rather than the beef-eating body, according to oppressive norms of heterosexual femininity. Nonetheless, vegetarian and vegan dating sites are arguably more akin to Christian or Jewish dating services than they are to queer or kink dating sites. They do not so much reflect a sexuality as a set of values and beliefs. It is not that Christians are only sexually attracted to other Christians or that Jewish people are only attracted to other Jews, at least not in some kind of immediate and visceral way. Rather, what clients of these dating sites anticipate is that they will be most compatible with people who share their faith or their beliefs, and likely most vegetarians and vegans seeking other vegetarians and vegans to date feel the same way. That said, Potts and Perry discuss the fact that a handful of people in a New Zealand survey, most of them women, did express a more visceral aversion to meat eaters and stated that they were only attracted to other vegans. It wasn't just about compatibility then, but about visceral attraction and desire. According to these interview subjects, the bodies of meat eaters repel them since they are constituted out of dead animals. Their mouths are unkissable since they have had dead animals and animal secretions in them, and their body fluids taste different because of what they eat. Called vegan sexuals are a marginal phenomenon, however, and the reality is that more meat eaters refuse to date vegetarians and vegans than the other way around, and studies have shown that many women who are vegan or vegetarian when single revert to eating meat and preparing meat when coupled in order to accommodate a meat-eating partner or children, if only to avoid preparing multiple meals. And yet, as Potts and Perry discuss, the mere idea that there might exist a feminine phenomenon of vegan sexuality or that some women might be rejecting men because of what they eat caused a massive expression of online outrage on the part of men that is comparable to the backlash against metrosexuality that Burkle discusses and particularly his discussion of the mantham. Here we see the online equivalent of men rioting in the streets, burning their underwear and destroying minivans in outrage that women are trying to dictate how they eat and threatening their meat supply and also their sex supply. This response of anger and the reassertion of the masculine right to eat meat is compared by both Burkle and Potts and Perry to a sense of male sex right. The idea that men have a right to meat continues to be caught up with the idea that they have a right to women's bodies and it is infuriating to some men that some women might tell them not to eat meat or refuse to have sex with them if they do. Although masculinity is described in most ecofeminist writings as anti-ecological or toxic not only to women but to the environment, 
queer communities have long shown that there are other ways to be masculine, that there are queer masculinities and female masculinities, as well as non-hegemonic heterosexual male masculinities. In other words, the hegemonic and toxic masculinity that is targeted and constructed by many of the advertisements seen today is but one kind of masculinity, and queer femme ecofeminist scholar Greta Gard has even explored the possibilities and potentials of what she calls eco-genders, including eco-masculinities. As Gard writes, perhaps it is past time to envision alternative genders, and particularly eco-masculinities, from an ecofeminist perspective. I'll leave you with Gard's question. What would it mean to redefine or reconceive an ecological masculinity? There was a boy A very strange enchanted boy They say he wandered very far, very far Over land and sea Little shy and sad of eyes, but very wise was he. And then one day, a magic day, he passed my way. And while we spoke of many things, fools and kings, this he said to me, the greatest thing you'll ever learn is just to lie. And be like